how to grow your e-commerce sales with best practice online merchandising. And that's our topic today. So I hope we're all in the right place. Uh, my name is Catherine Brown and I am the tech champion for e-commerce here at the Digital Network. So the Digital Culture Network, you found us, which is fantastic. Um, and we provide a fantastic uh, set of resources to the arts and culture sector. So webinars like this one you're attending here today. Um, we've got fantastic online resources for you on our Knowledge Hub over on our website. And also you can book in for one-to-one -one help and support. So that will be with a tech champion like me in any of our different specialist areas. So if you're interested in that, please do head on to the website, look for the Ask a Tech Champion page and book in for some one-to-one -one help and support, um, which is uh, free and available uh, to the arts sector. So the aim of this webinar today is to understand what online merchandising is and why it matters, to identify best practice for online merchandising and to learn how you can make landing pages work for you. So what is merchandising? Well, I thought I'd start off by looking at some definitions. So first of all, um, from the Oxford Languages Dictionary, um, they describe merchandising as the activity of promoting the sale of goods, especially by their presentation in retail outlets. Found another definition from the Collins Dictionary, the selection and display of goods in a retail outlet. So if I'm looking at these definitions here, some words which are really jumping out. So there's definitely something going on about presentation and display, you know, with the aim of promoting sales. There's also selection. That's a really important word in here. So how, how goods are selected. And we're going to spend a bit of time looking at that. And lastly, retail outlets. So there's a mention here about yeah, retail outlets, I think we typically associate that with shops, more traditional retail. And I actually, I, I was like, well, you know, can I find a definition for online merchandising? Is that something that's easy to come by? And actually, I hunted around various kind of dictionaries and nobody's really defining it as a thing. And I think one of the things we're going to look at today is how actually on, online merchandising incorporates a whole range of different practices. And... Um, a whole range of different practices and it's not that easy to sum up and define and actually it's kind of grown out of um you know history and tradition of traditional retail so we're going to have a little look at that um so let's continue so stepping back in time and thinking about that history we've got um some lovely images here so this is um harrods in the 1920s and this is their shop window and you can see lots of effort has gone into making those goods um, look fantastic. So how they're luring customers into that shop using that shop window. Uh, here we've got an image of the co-op. And this is um, really looking at how those products are displayed on the counter. So they're being put there at the point of transaction um, in that customer's journey. But there we go. Lovely pile of goods on the counter. And here we've got um, the Marks and Spencers store in uh, Birmingham in the 1930s. Lots of product arranged throughout the store, stacked up, kind of pile them high approach, perhaps. Also lots of lighting and a lot of thought would go into how this product was laid out and displayed within stores. So thinking about how customers move through the store. And actually so much thought would go into these things that, um, you know, back in the 20s, people even wrote books about it. So uh, this guy here, Paul Mazur, wrote a book called Principles of Organisation Applied to Modern Retailing. And if, I don't know, if you're some kind of business history geek, if such a category exists, this is kind of a cult text. And he said something um, in this book, which goes along these lines. He said, it is the responsibility of the merchandise division to provide for the consumer merchandise of the right style and quality in proper quantities at the right price and at the right time. And this has come to be known as a theory called the five R's of merchandising. And let's unpack a little bit what's within that. So he's, we're looking at making sure we've got the right product in front of the right customer at the right time. So thinking about within the journey, within the year, at the right price, 
and that we've got the right quantity. So, so not too much stock, not too little stock. And this is quite a foundational theory within merchandising. And you'll see that it kind of comes to underpin quite a lot of what we look at um, in terms of online merchandising. So I was just a bit interested in you know, how familiar this way of thinking may be to you. And I think we're just going to launch a little poll here now. So I think Rose, my colleague, is going to pull that up on screen um, about whether we've you've heard of the five R's before. So here we go. Fantastic. Um, that's up on screen for you. So take a moment. And yeah, what we're asking is this something you've heard of and you use? Not heard of it, but actually this way of thinking sounds familiar. Um, kind of familiar, sometimes think this way, sometimes don't, or entirely new, never heard of this. So we're getting a range of different answers coming in there now. So that's fantastic. So we'll let that run a little longer. Fantastic, lots of answers coming in there. Um, I think most people have responded now, so we'll give it a few few more seconds, just see what's up on screen. And it's great, it seems like there's quite a quite an even spread. So I'm going to ask Rose to conclude that poll now and we'll share those results on screen. Um, so yeah, so just sharing that with everybody, there's quite an even spread across you. So there's a range of experience and I would expect um, perhaps if you're in a large organisation, you've come up through a more traditional retail route, this type of merchandising theory is quite familiar to you. Um, if you haven't, you know, your career hasn't developed in a way, this might be new. And either way, there's going to be lots within this presentation today, which is going to touch on this theme of selecting and think about how we can translate this merchandising in an online environment. So cool. We will stop sharing that now. So um, hopefully that's off screen and I can continue. Um, so how do we translate this online? Well, we're going to be thinking about how we make the most use of our users' attention. We're going to be thinking about how we get them over the hurdle of shopping online. And we'll be thinking about what are the different signals that our users give us and how can we use those in our online merchandising. And, and just stepping back a moment, why does this matter? Well, you know, we might have a user who's visiting us on their smartphone or at home on a laptop. And in each instance, they're giving us their attention, their eyeballs are on our website. And actually quite a lot of work goes into getting that person to kind of be there on your website. So there might be some email marketing has got them to that point, perhaps a social media campaign. You might have been working on making sure your website's ranking well on Google and your SEO. Uh, you might have PPC campaigns which have brought that user to your website. You might have had some local press coverage. Again, that takes effort. Or it might simply be your signage that you've got great signage outside your venue and that's really bringing people to your website. Either way, uh, you, a lot of us got into getting people to your website and that's why we want to make the most of their, their, their attention and time. So we're going to be looking at eight areas of best practice. So first of all, how we can use that attention on the homepage, the category page and in the checkout. We're going to be thinking about some of those hurdles when shopping online, things which can be tricky, difficult, and how we can get people over those. And we're also going to be thinking about those signals that our users can, can give us. So let's dig straight in. So we're going to start off by looking at what we can do on our home pages. So we want to be really aware of what is visible above the fold. So above the fold is that zone which you can first see without scrolling. So whether you're on a smartphone, a laptop, an iPad, whatever it is, that zone which is immediately visible. And this is really important because if we don't show the right stuff there, people not, might not even bother to scroll any further or to click onto another page. We want to be making sure our homepage is seasonal and inspiring. We want to be surfacing both ranges and products. And let's have a little look at an example of this. So here, this is the National Portrait Gallery shop. And what I like about this is that this is really bold and clear. There's effective use of space. So you've got a kind of a clear navigation zone at the top and below that you've got some secondary messages explaining about uh, their, their free delivery offer, about how the, how the purchasing with them supports the gallery, 
Um, also in this above the fold zone, I've got access to my account, to search, to changing the currency. So there's quite a lot is available in this very first zone. And as well, they haven't shown me a wall of products. So I've come to the homepage of the shop and they haven't just presented me with 20 different products. Um, they're giving me routes into broader groups of product. And they're showing product that's related to the institution. So I can see this like lovely, very visual banner. It's mentioning an exhibition. It's showing work by David Hockney. It's colorful. There's portraiture in there. It feels on theme for who they are. Scrolling down a bit further, what I can see is this uh, homepage, it gives routes into ranges. So you can see that I can click into wall art, into stationery, into scarves. So they're giving me um, ways to access different ranges, but they're also highlighting key products. So you can see at the bottom, there are individual products which have been selected uh, to promote on the homepage. And what I really like about those is they're seasonally appropriate. So there's a nice woolly hat, which feels you know, the right thing for February, say. So really what's going on here is there's quite a lot of selecting. So they're thinking about the five R's, like what are the right products to be presenting to, to the right customer at this moment in time? So um, sometimes people really struggle to think of the homepage in terms of zones that can be merchandised. It can be quite natural in a shop to think about what's on that shelf, what's on this shelf. And actually you can kind of think about your homepage in the same way. So this is a kind of a skeleton layout or a wireframe that I put together a while back for somebody when I was trying to help them to think about the different zones on their site. And that a typical layout, you know, you will have a navigation at the top, you might have some kind of message about free shipping. And then you would have some kind of zones um, to present different ranges. Um, and then you might scroll down that page a bit further and you might have particular products highlighted. So this might help you understand it as a, an area to be, you know, you know, individual zones and pockets to be actively merchandised, to be changed with the seasons or to be changed to reflect what's going on in your organisation. So let's continue and look at what we can do on our category pages. So to make best use of our users' attention, we really want to be showing them the best-selling products first. So that should be our default order. We want to be actively managing out-of-stock items. We want to be showing a sensible amount of products. So I generally recommend a minimum of three items. Um, and if you've got a lot of products in a category, to look at whether you can provide some kind of filters. So again, let's dig in and look at some examples. So here we've got the London Transport Museum. And what I really like about this category page is first of all, it's ordered by, in this case, it says position, and that means the sales position. So we know that that Tube Lines mug is the best selling um, item in the mugs and coasters category. So we're really using that sales data. They aren't showing any out of stock items. So these four items, which are showing up first, they're all available for sale. It's really not great if you come, you click through to a category page and the first stuff which is showing above the fold is out of stock. That's a waste of space. It's a waste of your user's attention. I like that there are 12 items in this category. That's a healthy amount of product to have in a category. Uh, this, you know, it gives your customers a range to kind of browse through and consider. So sensible depth. And I like that, you know, there are filters available. So I know in some of the other categories for the London Transport Museum, there, there are more products. And so they've thought about how can they make it easier for customers to, to find what they're looking for. So looking, continuing on, thinking about attention and how to make the best of it. Let's have a look at the checkout. So... Here, we're thinking about the point of transaction and what can we do? What are the additional things we can do? So um, it's quite important to be able to take a donation. We're all arts and cultural organisations and donations are quite important to, to our uh, financial position. Um, we want to be using compelling copy to support that. And we want to be thinking about how can we um, uh, support future communications, return customers etc so we want to be offering an opt-in for some email communications so again let's have a little look at that so here we have the vagina museum and what i like about their checkout first of all is right up there with the very first stage is 
an opt-in for email for email communications. And if we continue down that checkout page, um, I can see there's an area called make a donation. And I really like that in the copy, they emphasize their charitable status. So they say the Vagina Museum is a charity and a gift of any size would mean the world to us. So that's great copy. And also they've done it with personality and mission. So thank you for supporting the world's first bricks and mortar museum dedicated to vaginas, vul vulvas and the, the gynecological anatomy. So it's sharing a little bit about who they are. So, and that helps people be like, oh yes, I do want to make a donation. And the last thing I'd mention here on this page is they've chosen to set the default donation to none. Um, this is what I would typically advise. Um, it means you're not annoying any customers by presuming they'll make a, a donation. So let's continue and think about our next area of best practice, which is all about how we can help people over some of the online hurdles of shopping. I'm just going to have a little sip of water. Yeah, so what might some of those hurdles be? Well, First of all, there's quite a bit of uncertainty involved in online shopping. And that mostly stems about comes about because there's a lack of the physical experience. We don't get to pick up and touch, feel those goods in advance. Uh, we don't get to walk out of the shop door with that item there and then. We've got questions in our head about shipping, how much that might cost, um, uh, how quickly it might arrive. So there's quite a lot more uncertainty. So our websites have to do quite a bit more work to, to get people to um, make that purchase. So let's look at how online merchandising can help with that. So first of all, we're going to look at our navigation. So in a shop, it's quite easy to glance around. On your website, your navigation has to do quite a lot of hard work. People need to use that in order to find what they're looking for. So what can we do? First up, we want to be making sure that all products can be reached. We're wanting to be using nice, simple language. And we want to be making sure we're not hiding key product areas. And I'm going to show you some examples of that, about how sometimes some of the language we can use might not be as useful to the customers as we think. And we're going to be, want to be make sure that we've got nice seasonal topical collections on our navigation. So let's jump in and look at some examples. So here we are. This is the V&A shop. And what I like about this is this nice, simple language um, on that navigation. If we look up there, jewellery, books, prints, etc. Um, it's really easy to understand categories. I get what they are. And there we can see as well, there's exhibitions and there's Christmas. I did put this material together prior to the new year. So you know, these are very seasonal at the time. If I look into that exhibitions um, uh, category, I'll see a whole range of their different exhibitions um, highlighted. So let's have a little dig in and see what else we can learn from their navigation. There we go, seasonal collections. So I'm gonna dig in a little more. And here I am, I'm still on the v &A shop and I'm looking in the home category. And I'm going to choose to have a look in here at mugs, cups and drinkware. So if I click on that category, what I get is that category page. And what I see is mugs uh, and the tumbler. So this is, this is great. Um, I've clicked on something which says mugs and I have got some mugs and that might sound incredibly obvious, but it's a really important point. The category has returned what the user expected it to. And this is what we're always aiming for in our online journeys, for customers to, to, to want something and for us to then be able to you know, provide that to them, to, so to serve them the, the material, the products they are interested in. So let's have a little look in as well. Let's look at, um, in at home decor and accessories. So if I have a little click and look into that page, this is what I see. So on these search results, uh, I've got a candle has come up. I've got a little uh, felt decoration. I've got this thing called a red daruma. Not quite sure what that is. Some coasters, a magnet. So the first question going through my head is, who is this category for? Is this a good browsing experience? It's, it's quite a strange selection of stuff, you might say. And I would kind of argue that this category is kind of operating a bit like a lucky dip box. Like when that uh, user clicks on home decor and accessories, they don't really have a clear idea of what they're going to get. 
and they kind of get this you know mishmash of stuff you know within that category and I would argue this category probably has been put together more to serve the kind of retail team who they're kind of aware they need to provide links to some of this stuff and they're not quite sure where it all belongs I'm not sure that this is a category which is as useful to a customer and if I scroll down a little bit more so I can see here there's a few more products within this category so I see a candle holder and three more candles and obviously remember the very first product in this category was a candle as well so at this point I've kind of got a bit of a question going through my head about these candles like should candles have their own category um, and so I'm going to do a bit more digging on that so I've gone and I've used their search function I've actually found actually they've got whole whole we've got nine different products all seemingly related to candles so if you have a sizable range of something that's got a very clear easily understandable name i would argue it should be present on your navigation you know, ca a candles page could easily sit under the home category um, and so it, it's something to really think about like can are there groups of product that you can easily name and identify that you've got a sensible depth of that therefore should be grouped together as a category and presented on your navigation. Um, I often try and encourage people to try and go for the Ron seal approach, like does what it says on the tin. So candles, I click it, I'd get these results. A little bit like we saw with the mugs, it was it, it, the naming convention, it made a lot of sense. So I, as much as you can to try and aim for that way of doing things and to avoid what I call that lucky dip uh, box approach. So there are some tools we can use um, to help us uh, test out a navigation. Um, and this is one called Glue Maps. Um, it's an online tool and you can use it to have a play round with different um, like layouts of navigation. Um, and my buddy Andy is just going to drop that link in um, the chat box if anybody wants to, to use that. And it's just a really easy way to play around with what some of those hierarchies could look like without having to mess around or touch the back end of your website. So definitely have a go with that. And yeah, test out that wording and try and avoid, you know, things like the Lucky Dip box, accessories, etc. So let's continue and let's get into the quite meaty topic of product pages. So these really bring to life products um, for our customers. They relate them to our target customer and or the occasion. And they provide key factual information. Um, quite often we're trying to make sure that we're telling the story of our products, highlighting their provenance. Um, as arts and cultural organizations, we often have some really quite lovely product with some which has got quite a lot of story behind it. So we want to make sure we highlight that. So product descriptions, let's talk about these first. Actually, they need to communicate quite a lot of information. So you should be aiming to cover these key questions. So who is this product for? What are the benefits of it? When and what occasion is it for? Is it for a daily use, something for a special occasion? Where might it be used? Is this something for home, for work, et cetera? And how does it work? There might be some, some kind of instructional elements or something which needs to be understood. So generally, um, yeah, we want to be covering these key areas. And typically, we'd expect to see one to three sentences um, plus some bullet points um, to support. Retail is detail and product specifications do matter. So this is when we're really getting into the nitty gritty um, for our products. And, and this is really important because as I was saying before, you know, people can't, you know, pick these items up, touch, feel, look, read labels. So we have to do all that work for them. And here is just some of what I would expect to see. So, um, and this is, this slide is quite dense with text, but hopefully it'll be some useful reference material. So um, if you're selling artwork, I'd expect to see the dimensions of that work, whether it's framed or unframed. Um, I'd want to know the material of that artwork and when it was made. Um, I have seen paintings on sale for thousands of pounds, which have failed to mention whether they're an oil painting or a watercolor or acrylic or whatever. That's not a good move. 
homewares. Um, obviously, I want to know about the dimensions, the weight, um, the material, what something's made of, um, whether it's dishwasher proof, washable where it's made. Clothing, again, um, sizing, that's really important. You might want to provide a size guide to help people understand that. Again, material, uh, is it washable where it was made? Toys and games, we need to be thinking about things like the age range. Again, our favorites, the dimensions and weight and players, like how many, if it's a game, how many players is that game for? Food and drink, um, some of you may have some of this on sale on your website. Again, we want to be thinking about ingredients, storage instructions, allergens, and our old favourites, dimensions and weight. So yeah, just hopefully a little reference slide to check whether you know, you're covering all of that in your product specifications. And as well as kind of the text side of things, images are obviously vital that really bring our product to life. So we want to be able to see our product from all sides. So a product page really should have multiple images on, of a product. Um, I'd want to see high res zoom images, so things which really give me a feel of the texture of that product. I'd like a sense of scale, um, and I'll show you some examples of how you can use hands or other items, or perhaps if, or perhaps a model to help uh, understand scale and personality. Like I think it's really important that imagery reflects the tone of your organisation. So let's have a look at some examples. Um, here we've got uh, the South London Gallery. Um, and this is a really lovely product page and it's great. What I'm really seeing here is and multiple different images. So scrolling down those next two images also pop up as well. Um, so I'm really seeing this product from all angles. I can see the bottom of that cup, the bottom of the saucer. I can see both sides of the text running around that um, uh, teacup and saucer. So they're really giving me as as full a um, feeling of what this product is like as possible. So that's excellent. Here we are over on the Northern Print website. And I pulled this out as an example of good high res zoom imagery. So there's quite a lot of detail there on that um, print of all these tiny little figures and trees. Um, I can really get a feel for the, the pencil marks of that titling running around the bottom. So that's excellent. Um, just looking to the left though, um, you know, they, have, they haven't they have filled in the medium or the dimensions or the edition number. So that's really not great. Um, but I did want to, you know, show an example of good high res zoom imagery. And it's something which I noticed that a, a lot of people within the sector do struggle with. Um, so, uh, yeah, if that's something you'd like to talk to me about, I'd be really happy to pick up any conversations one to one. So here we have an example, and this is from Kettle's Yard who have got a very lovely online shop. And what I really picked out from this product imagery is the use of hands. So both this product on the left and this on the right, there's a hand holding that bowl, there's a hand holding that jug. And in addition to the hand giving a sense of scale, they're also kind of bringing those products to life through using them, you know, putting fruit in the bowl, using the jug to pour a drink. And also in this example with the jug as well, that bottle is also helping give us a sense of scale as to how big these uh, tumblers are. So yeah, showing scale in imagery is really a good thing to do. And I'd also pick up at this point as well, I think this imagery is really reflective of Kettle's Yard's kind of um, look and feel. So if you've ever um, been lucky enough to visit, and it is a beautiful place to visit, um, the whole, you know, house and... Um, uh, and kind of gallery um, has a lovely soft light and it's very muted tones and colours throughout and I feel like this is very much reflected in in this photography. Um, and lastly I'm just going to show you an example um, of artwork and um, how we can give a sense of scale. So this is an example from the Tate and that what they're doing here is this is using a mock-up tool to, you know, I think we can probably all tell this isn't quite a real, um, you know, vase and chest of drawers and whatnot. Um, so they're using a tool and there are quite a few available. And um, one which is used a lot is called Canvi. And my colleague Andy's just going to drop a link to that in the chat. And the thing I really wanted, obviously putting it in a room setting, it helps you give a sense of scale. But the thing I really wanted to highlight here is 
the real element of this image, which is doing the hard work in terms of giving a sense of scale, is that door. So we tend to know how big a human is, how big a doorway is, and it's that door which really helps us understand how large that print um, hanging on the wall is. So be aware of that. If you're just showing, you know, your artwork, you know, suspended above a lot a sofa, actually, you know, a sofa could be a small dinky sofa or some, you know, massive giant sofa. So it doesn't actually work as an indication of scale. It's things like doors and people that do. So yeah, that's another example of how we can show scale. So making the most of provenance. We really want to be highlighting if something has been made by an artist, a maker, a local business and telling their story. If there's something has been made by hand, if there's an artisan method, again, we want to be bringing that out, you know, in the description, in the images. We want to be highlighting if a product is exclusive to you. And this is an example here. So we're on um, the Royal Academy shop. And this is a special edition um, of an artwork by uh, Frank Bowling. Um, and you can see, first of all, there's quite a lot of images available, um, both close up and zoomed in and some in the making of it. And there's quite a bit of description there explaining a bit about um, how and why this work has come about. And actually, if I scroll down a bit as well, uh, well I can see there's even more about the product story and there's the opportunity to click in and learn more about Frank Bowling. This is an example again from Northern Print. Um, this is a much simpler example. It's a small screen print. Um, it's not on sale for £7,000, but it's obviously still important, an important piece of work. And this website takes the time to present some information about the artist. So this works by Josie Brooks. There's a little bit about, of information about where she's based, you know, in the local area, you know, how she works and what she's interested in. And this really helps because it helps people understand, you know, the artist they're buying for, you know, the work they're supporting. So, you know, if you have work by artists, makers, craftspeople, um, do share their stories. Another example here, this is from the Migration Museum. Uh, this is a, a Christmas card, which has de been designed by somebody called Sakina. And if I scroll down, this is even some more information. It says, meet the maker. And there's a little bit more information about who she is um, and the work she does. And there's even a lovely image of her in, in the middle of that panel. Um, and that all really helps bring to life who the artist is and helps convince people um, to make a purchase. So our last part of our online hurdles. So we think about shipping and it can be a big area of uncertainty. So what can we do to communicate this well? First of all, we don't want to be making people guess what it is and to make that information really nice and easy to find. We want to be really clear about those shipping costs and how long it takes to get there. So let's have a little look at some examples. Um, here we have We the Curious, a lovely science museum based down in Bristol. And what I like about this is they're making really good use of this zone at the top of the site called the announcement bar. Um, this is present wherever you are browsing through um, the shop and it shares their free shipping offer available if you spend over a certain amount. Um, while I'm on the product page, um, even if I'm not spending £50, um, I can click this button here, shipping, and I can find out about how much that might cost me. Um, so it's really important. There's a link from the product page. And as well, when I go into the basket, I've got an item added here. Again, there's a little link, so shipping. So again, at all these points, I'm providing routes to find out what that shipping information is um, to try and help remove that area of uncertainty. So link from the basket, also really important. And yeah, this is what a shipping page might look like. They actually don't have to be complicated. We want to be keeping them nice and simple. Um, and what I really like about this is simple and easy to read. And they've chosen to address their biggest customer group first. So they're based in the UK. So they start off with information which is about the UK customer. And then later on, they go on to talk about, you know, postage to elsewhere. So that's absolutely the right way around to be presenting this information. So moving on to the next stage. So thinking about what signals our users can give us. Um, so 
customers uh, kind of browse around our site. Um, they do that by mouse, by swiping. They also sometimes type things into our website too. And these can all be different kinds of signals that we can use for our online merchandising. So we'll, we'll be digging into that. I'm just gonna have another little sip of water. And I appreciate we're covering quite a lot, but yeah, the recording of this webinar will be available later. Um, so don't worry if you haven't quite got everything, um, but it's great to be sharing this with you. So how can we use signals to improve our product page? Well, first of all, what are these signals? I'm talking about interest signals. So what, what have we learned by the fact that somebody has gone to this product page about what they're interested in and from their other movements around the site? How can we use this to improve the online journey? And by this, I'm really thinking about how can I make sure that I'm getting more relevant buying options in front of the customer? So let's have a little look in at some of these examples. So here we are and we're back on a Kettle's Yard product page. And this is because it's a really nice example. You can see here at the bottom that we're using the browsing history. So you also viewed. So this little zone at the bottom of the product page is taking advantage of what we know they've already been interested in. And in case they want to go back to those items, it's using that space for, the, for them. So that's one option of something we can do on the product page to, to improve the online journey. Um, we can also do other things. So here we are, this is an example from the Baltic shop a lovely lobster tea towel. And we can see at the bottom, some items are being recommended. And these are thematic recommendations. So they seem to be related to kind of, you know, blue items, there's kind of some under the sea theme. So it's related to that item. Uh, now, another example from the Turner Contemporary and really lovely set of candles, which I quite fancy myself. And here, the zone at the bottom of the product page is being used to suggest other items uh, the customer might like. And it's using the fact that they've chosen to look at a particular category of item. And so it's showing them other alternatives within the candle category. So these are all good examples of how we can use, make use of browsing data to offer relevant options on the product page. Um, I noticed there's a couple of raised hands and questions going in. Any questions? Yeah, if you're able to pop them into the Q&A and Andy will pick them up with me at the end. If there's technical issues, do like drop that into the chat and Andy will be on hand to help. Um, fantastic. So uh, using signals from your search box. So we can use this to learn what users are looking for. And also importantly, we're gonna be able to find, about, find out about what users can't find. So this here is the Art UK website, um, and they've got a really large prominent search box. And um, actually one of the largest, uh, most prominent search boxes of any arts or cultural organization. I spent quite a lot of time hunting around. Um, and very kindly, um, they've offered to provide a little bit of data from behind the scenes. So um, I was really interested to find out that of people visiting their site, 9% of um, their sessions use site search. So it's not being used by everybody at all, but it's a, a, like a decent uh, kind of chunk of customers are choosing to engage with site search. And so there's something we can learn from, from that data. So we're gonna have a little dig in and look at that. And um, so thank you, Art UK. And I think some of the team are here with us. So yeah, really appreciate this uh, insight. So they shared with us what were some of their most searched terms in a three month period. So first of all, we can see there was you know, over a million searches and there's a very long tail of search results. So there's over a million searches and the most frequently searched is this term Kiffin Williams Prince. So that tells me if there's only a hundred people looking for that across a million searches, there's gonna be a lot, a lot of long tail entries here. First of all, what do I want to be doing with these most search terms? I want to be checking whether these things are easily accessible via the navigation, because obviously quite a lot of people are interested in them. And also I want to be having a look at what are the quality of those search results? Lots of people are looking for it. So let's just check up at what's that experience they are getting. So let's have a little dig in. And we're gonna look at this uh, Kiffin Williams. And actually if we look across that um, top 
12, that actually there's three different terms in there relate to Giffin, and that's 221 searches um, related to that artist. So let's have a look. So first up, I'm having a look um, on their navigation. And what's really fantastic to see that he's highlighted on their artist list. So that's brilliant um, that he's being pulled out. There's also a nice visual to the right. So um, this team are probably aware that this is um, a popular artist of theirs. So it's listed there uh, along with the visuals. So that's fantastic. If I then click through to that um, category page for Kiffin Williams, it's a really good landing page. Um, there's both visuals and text at the top of the page. So there's a bit of context about the artist, an example of his work. And I really like that this is ordered by best selling displayed first. So it's probably quite small on this screenshot, but it does say the sort option is by position. So this image of this uh, walker walking to his cottages and this sunset there, some of the best selling um, examples of this artist's work. So this is a great, great category page. Um, if I'm now typing Kiffin in, um, some, some suggestions come up as auto suggest. And I was kind of a little bit surprised because actually those aren't the most, they aren't the best selling items. So the kind of question going through my head at this point is, are these auto suggested search products, are they best selling? I kind of don't think they are because of what I've learned from the previous page, or are they particularly relevant? Like if you've got some new item in stock or something's happened, there's some reason why you want to be highlighting that product. That could be another reason that, that you would highlight it here. Um, likewise, when I click through on the actual search results page itself, I get a different, another slightly different selection of Kiffin Williams products. And again, the kind of question going through my head is, are these best selling? Are they the most relevant? And so this is something um, that if I was their team, I just want to have a dig into and check, like, are these the very best things I want to be um, presenting in these search results? And um, search functionality, um, sometimes it's provided directly within your e-commerce platform. Sometimes there are plugins which power it. Um, but often there are ways to manually merchandise those search results to pin something to, to the top. Um, or to um, eliminate something from the results. It varies from platform and tool, um, but it's something to have a look into um, to see how you can improve the quality of these results for your customers. And again, if that's something you want to look into, um, I'm very happy to book in one-to-one -one time with people. So the other thing we can learn about is what people have been looking for, but we haven't been able to provide any results. So no results found. So you can see here, somebody, 67 people have typed Dorothy Steele into the site search box, and we haven't been able to provide any results for that search term. So the questions going through my head at this point is, do we have, um, uh, do we have some item, um, stock which is relevant to this search term? Um, so is there a product which we should be surfacing or is there something which we should consider stocking? You know, should we be having a conversation with our retail team saying, you know, so many people are looking for Dorothy Steele, like, should we have some product? So this is really important for understanding what your customers are looking for. So with this in mind, how good do you think your search and dizing is? So that's a, a bit of a, a, a mashing of search and merchandising. And I think Rose is going to drop a poll um, for us on screen. Um, I like the little laughter tears. Yes, it is a funny one. So how good do you think you are? So really good, you're using all these methods. Um, room for improvement, we've done some of this, but could do more. Oh my gosh, this is a bit of a bombshell, all new. Lots to think about here. So fantastic that I've um, got some, some results coming in here. I'll just give that a few more moments. Brilliant. Fantastic, lots of results pouring in. Um, so yeah, it looks like for a lot of people, it feels like this this is come, could be quite a new area. And then I think I'm just gonna ask uh, Rose to share those results up on screen. We've got a good feeling for, for where we're at. So yeah, so for most people, they think there's some room for improvement. So I'm really glad that there's some new things I was able to share with you today. And for a lot of people, this is quite new. I've never kind of thought about this notion of search and dizing. So I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. Um, so yeah, that's fantastic. So we will stop sharing those results and uh, we will carry on with our, our story. Fantastic. So um, are they 
Is that now? Yeah, fantastic. Brilliant. So, ooh. so, so far we've learned about attention, what we can be doing on our homepage, our category page and in the checkout. We've thought about some of those hurdles um, to get over when shopping online. And we've thought about some of those signals, so what we can learn from the search box and from browsing behaviour. And we're now going to look at how we can bring those three areas together into what I call the magic of landing pages. So what is a landing page? Well, it's a page that a visitor lands on from clicking on an email campaign, a paper click advert, an organic search result, a blog article. So it's, it's a page which people arrive on in your website and they've come from somewhere in particular. And what's special about it? Well, it's like a way into your site. It's a little bit like the shop door. So if we think back to those lovely black and white images where we saw how much effort went into, you know, thinking about what the customer would encounter in the doorway and as they move to the shop, it's similar. It's like an online version of that. And what's really important is that in the online world, you know something about what they're interested in because we know where they've come from, which email campaign, which search result, which PPC ad, which blog article. So what can we use all of that for? Well, here's an example. And this is an email campaign I received from the Tate um, offering me 15% off uh, some exhibition books. And what I really liked about this, so this was the email and on the right is the landing page. And what I really liked about it, first of all, that landing page, it repeats the offer. So we know where the, cost, where the user came from, so we can repeat that offer. So repetition, repetition, repetition. And it's repeated at the top of the page and it's also repeated by the products. Um, the styling is quite familiar. So from the email to the landing page, um, you know, that kind of feeling of like that black surround is quite familiar. And also that headline product. So this Hilma AF Clint book, very visual. You know, I was interested. It was, there was something about this image which interested me enough to click it. And then that's repeated again. So, so a customer's expressed an interest in something. So again, return what they're expecting. And I've got a good product depth here. So 64 items, which are a part of this 15% offer. So that's a healthy amount of product to be interesting. Um, you know, if there's only two or three books there, it wouldn't be quite so compelling. So what is the magic of landing pages? Well, there's multi, you get to have multiple entries to your site. So there's not just one shop door. So traditional world, you've, you've only get that one way into the shop, but for your website, you have all these different routes. So from your email campaign, from your social media posts, from your blog articles, et cetera. So you've got many opportunities to optimize. You'll get to whiz people to a relevant part of the site. So they, you know something about what they're interested in because of what they clicked on. So you can make sure that what you're serving to them is very relevant to their expectations. And you can reinforce that original message. So whatever that hooked them, they got them to click through in the first place, we want to be reinforcing that message to maximize our conversion rate. So here, what we're seeing is we can use some of the signals, what we know of the customer's interest. We can make the most of the use of the attention. So making sure we're showing something relevant to that, that interest, that signal. And we can use some of our online merchandising tricks about getting them over the hurdles of shopping online. And if we bring all those things together, it gives us a real chance of increasing our online revenues. So what have we looked at today? Well, we've been talking about online merchandising and we've gone back in time and we've thought about where does that come from? What are the roots of traditional merchandising? And what's some of the theory that underpins it? So we've thought about these five R's and these ideas of selection. So getting the right product for the right customer, at the right time, at the right price, and in the right quantity. And then we've thought about how that translates in a digital world. So how we make the best use of our customer's attention, how we use the signals they give us to get them over those hurdles of shopping online. So I hope that has given you lots of uh, lovely ideas and inspiration for your online merchandising. I've really enjoyed sharing this with you today. And we're gonna move on to our Q&A which I think uh, Andy, um, my buddy, will be joining to help take us through some of your questions. Hi, Cass. 
Hello. Um, great job. Well done. Uh, covered a lot of ground there. Fantastic. We don't have a huge amount of time for questions, but we have had uh, a number come in. So in fairness, I think we're going to go through them in chronological order, Kath, if that's all right. So I'm going to yell them out, put you on the spot, and then you'll give a very, very succinct answer. Okay, so kicking off, um, a question from Esther G, and it's regarding category pages. What do you mean by actively manage out-of-stock items? Good does that, question. Does, does that mean don't display them, she's asking? Yeah, so you've got a choice. So you either... Um, push them to the bottom of your listings and in certain e-commerce platforms you're able to do that or or you you make sure that everything is in stock is pinned to the top so that's dependent on what your functionality is or you take them off sale but the one thing to be aware if you take them off sale is when they come back in stock you need to make sure you publish them back online otherwise you won't be selling any of them so that's why i use the terminology actively manage so um Ideally, you should be monitoring everything which is coming up as out of stock, like probably on a weekly basis um, versus what your inventory is. OK, brilliant. Esther, I hope that answers your question. Um, I should, uh, before I continue, just very, very quickly self-describe. So my name's Andy. I am a white male, short hair, glasses, trimmed beard and dark top. Um, Erica Chambers um, from the Dorking Museum. We are a tiny museum with a tiny budget. We have an online shop that is quite amateur compared to the big museums. At the moment, we use a free Shopify template and it looks like a free template. Would you recommend spending money on a more professional setup or should we just hope that people take pity on us? Um, so I would say uh, free templates can work well. There's nothing wrong with that. It's more about thinking about what content you're displaying, the quality of your image, making sure that your messaging is good in terms of what you offer in shipping. Um, I'd be really happy if you want to book in for some time, we could take a look at it together and see how you can get as far as you can on a free template. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be a barrier. You don't need to be spending lots of money on it. All right, brilliant. Erica, if you want to set up a call with Kath, I have put a link in the chat to um, to the page on our website where you can book a call. Indeed, that goes for anyone who's on the call who'd be interested in tapping into Kath's experience and skills. Um, go ahead and book a call with her um, at your earliest convenience. Right, next one is from Lee Phillips. Um, I have different ranges of pottery, i.e. different designs. So each design is a category in itself. Um, in each range are types of pots, mugs, bowls, vases, etc. So like a collection, I guess. Yeah. Um, I have categories of pots. Um, and the question is, should they be organized by category, i.e. pots? Or would you recommend to stick with uh, ordering and structuring it by kind of collection, if you like? So best practice, you want to offer your customer the ability to browse by both routes. So if it's like pots, mugs, cups, they might want to shop that way or if they're like the blue design the christmas design the yellow design they want to be able to shop by that um so yeah again i'm really happy to spend some time with you on helping you figure out how your navigation is configured it depends on on your platform um but the principle you're aiming for is to offer your your customer those two routes Okay, fantastic. Thanks, Kath. Got a couple of questions around books here. Um, the first one that came in was from Malcolm Henson, and he says, do you think that books could be merchandised by e-commerce? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And um, that's quite a big open question. I mean, people can sell them online and you can do a better or worse job of displaying them. Um, I see some great examples of arts and culture organisations thinking really thematically about their books. So thinking, I'm trying to, um, so for an example I'd say is the Brunel Museum. Um, they think about engineering books, history books, and they're thematically bringing some of this life and thinking of themselves as an editor who knows their area well and sharing that ability to edit and pull an interesting range together. If you think about shopping in say waterstones or whatever they put an interesting selection of stuff on a table right and like often those tables are kind of thematic you can kind of be doing the same to pulling together interesting selections of books if you've obviously if you've got hundreds of books it can be quite a chore for your customer they're not going to browse through them a to z so you need to be thinking about how do i break them up into interesting thematic chunks and that's a really valuable retail thing that arts and culture organizations can do 
Okay, fantastic. And just linked to that question from Liz um, Brooking. I hope I pronounced that correctly. When selling books, how much information is useful? I'm concerned that too much information will be boring and turn customers off. Yeah, it, yeah. So books as well are interesting because obviously there are some very big players out there. Amazon, you know, they're not my favorite whatsoever, but they're out there and they dominate this sector. Um, so there's a lot of product copy that's already there. So do you want to write your your own unique version or do you want to reuse something that's already out there? Um, one thing I often do recommend um, is if you've got higher price point books, so say you've got interesting art books, photography books, that's often something that arts and culture organisations do. If they're quite beautiful objects in themselves, I would really think about the photography of them. So how you can make them look like beautiful, appealing you know, objects to own, books to read, that they're not just a kind of 9.99 paperback, as it were. Um, and that so in that instance, imagery can be really important. But yes, you don't want to be giving the whole plot away. Um, I would say, um, like people like Amazon, there's an awful lot of information there. Like, you know, I probably wouldn't try and write more than they write. That would that sounds like overkill. So I hope that gives a bit of guidance. Um, if you're interested in um, good book imagery i'd look at a site called oh, i want to check the name of it rare books and mags um they're quite a small independent stockist um I'll, I'll make sure it goes out in the resources that get sent out okay brilliant just conscious of time i've probably got time for one more question just keeping an eye on the chat getting some fantastic feedback kath so i think a lot of people really appreciate uh, the presentation today uh here is a question from helen helen s do you have any recommendations for low cost website templates? We're a small publisher based in a library, mainly selling local history books and literature based themed gifts. Yeah, absolutely. So um, a lot of this decision will depend on like what your existing website is. I'm guessing you probably have one. So you're pro you're looking at a platform that you know plugs into your existing infrastructure well and there are very there are various low cost options out there um i'd be happy to like go look at some of that with you typically people are looking at things like um either a wordpress and woocommerce combination um you can look at uh, things like squarespace wix and um, shopify is out there as a great platform as well they each have slightly different costs and implications um i'd be really happy to look at that with you but yes you can do it there are also alternatives where you don't even have to go to the full web shop experience kind of quick payment links um is a very minimal way of getting something up and trading so be really happy to chat about that okay brilliant um so i think one final question then and this comes from liz brooking again i think uh, how often should one refresh the landing page and by the landing page i'm guessing she may mean the home page yeah so it's quite a lot of work to maintain it you're, you're probably not going to change it every day that would be overkill um probably every month i would suggest absolutely every season like spring summer autumn winter um it also partly depends on how much how frequently you have new product coming into stock so if you have new product coming into stock you probably want to be highlighting that and um, so yeah probably monthly if you're a huge organization possibly possibly closer to weekly um if you get really into it you can start to monitor what's selling very well off your home page and then start to make decisions as to what gets a position on the home page based on sales and that's getting into much bigger traffic and bigger organization territory fantastic um so just to conclude, I've just put a link into Kath's bio on the Digital Culture website. If any of you would like to have a call with Kath, um, please use that link to do so. Um, Kath, thanks for the brilliant presentation today. Is there anything you'd like to say before we conclude? No, just brilliant to have everybody join us. Um, yeah, do get in touch if you'd like some one-to-one -one support. Always happy to do so. And yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you for being here. Great, great, uh, great to have you here.